So let's just take a look at some of the rhetoric that has uh, come through from uh, emerging markets when it comes to a lot of the criticism that we've seen out of the developed world. Do you think a lot of that criticism is warranted in terms of ensuring that balance is once again struck? I think you say once again struck. I think the correct term should be struck for the first time. And I think generally over the course, certainly over the past several decades, the uh, global institutional financial system has, of course, naturally been heavily skewed towards uh, European and, and North American Japanese institutions. And at least the leadership of the IMF and World Bank rotates between a, an American or European leader, uh, respectively. So, of course, there are some imbalances there, which have only really become more pronounced with China's rise as a major economic power, now the world's second largest economy, uh, with India's rise, Brazil's, uh, and certainly with certain influential shifts in the importance of Africa and broader Latin America, in not only in economic terms, but in political and geostrategic terms. So certainly a rebalancing or at least a greater representation amongst these multilateral bodies is necessary to represent uh, the global economy. And I think the BRICS summit is certainly symbolically, more than in real terms, representing or at least pushing for that diversification. Some are very concerned that with the BRICS nations, is based, it's going to fizzle out at some point, that they're not going to have the traction uh, that they'd like uh, and a sustainable uh, platform to ensure that they are heard. Is this your view as well? Do you think we could actually see this coming into jeopardy soon? I think the BRICS grouping as it stands is a, the inclusion of South Africa made BRICS uh, an overtly political rather than a commercial entity. So we really are talking about a political vehicle which lacks institutional structure. Uh, none of the agreements which might be struck uh, in, in New Delhi this week uh, and similarly in Sanya last year have any real binding characteristics and as a result it lacks that, that structure which uh, in many organizational bodies and multilateral bodies uh, need in order to ensure their continuity. One factor which a lot of people are saying might influence the disintegration of BRICS is the fact that many other nations deserve to be there. Uh, Indonesia is a, one of the, I think, the fifth largest emerging economy in the world, a huge population, Mexico, Thailand, Turkey, and so on. Uh, so if BRICS as an idea is to be broadened, it will lose the structure of that BRIC underpinning, which in a way it did by including South Africa anyway. So I think that institutional block is symbolic of a shift to the emerging world of a more multipolar environment and whether BRICS stays or not is mostly incidental. Let's also, I mean, what we do see between the BRICS nations and also the emerging market space, and of course it is fair to say, as you say, that there are other uh, powerhouses within the emerging market space. A lot of the emerging markets are starting to do business a lot more with each other. Trade is occurring uh, quite extensively. Uh, and this is why we're starting to see uh, perhaps emerging markets getting more of a say going forward. How, do you think that this could actually last, Simon? Do you think that this is something that is sustainable? Absolutely. The structural underpinnings of rising intra-emerging market trade are very robust. So if you look at China, for example, I think you and I spoke last week about the rise in China-Africa trade, almost counter to what we're seeing throughout the advanced world where trade with Africa has not yet reached uh, the 2008 peak levels, has returned to those levels. It's a structural story based on a commodity demand, based on rising consumer markets and the ability to provide the manufacturing goods of the iron and steel and the commodities to really push that growth. So I think it's structural, I think it has legs, and we're not going to see an abating of that overall uh, EM story. And, and as we've emphasized in the past, this is you've got to look beyond BRICS for that. And that's why we've outlined the EM10, which we feel are the most important 10 emerging markets for Africa, including South Africa, including Nigeria. So it's a more wider picture, it's a, it's a multipolar picture, but certainly it has very strong structural underpinnings. One factor which I'm encouraged by at the BRICS summit uh, is this idea of trading in each other's, trading and investing in each other's domestic currencies. And it's going to be a very long time before the US dollar is destabilized as the world's reserve currency. But I think the, the, the demand uh, to trade more in renminbi and rail and rand and rupee and ruble, I think those demand structures and the fact that BRICS is institutionalizing that to an extent uh, is a very positive development. Okay, so let's also just touch on some of the numbers, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, local currencies because it's starting to occur more so, and we know that the yen is being used uh, quite extensively, so too is there in Mimbi. Uh, let's also just touch on BRICS, uh, just under $1.3 trillion smaller than the U.S. It is said, uh, and I think these are your words, that it could actually overtake the U.S. in 2013 and account for half of the world's population and FX reserve. Surely that kind of clout does mean that BRICS and uh, emerging markets can trade in whatever currency they choose. 
And we're seeing increasingly that's taking place. However, still over 80% plus of the trade between these nations has a US dollar pairing. So the dollar, of course, is still the predominant reserve currency, the predominant currency of trade in the world, and will remain so for the foreseeable future. What we've estimated is that if you look at China-Africa trade, we estimate that by 2015, around 40% of total China-Africa trade will take place in renminbi. That's obviously going to lower the cost of that trade. It's going to reduce barriers. It's going to increase the fluidity of Chinese investment on the continent. Uh, not dramatically, but it certainly will support uh, some of the very positive trends that we've seen taking place. The BRICS, yes, as five nations, perhaps in the economic terms you needn't include South Africa, are uh, only marginally smaller than the United States. But then again, uh, the BRICS itself lacks the institutional, uh, as I mentioned before, that structure to really position itself coherently against the US as a single entity. If you also look at strategic geopolitical concerns, <laughs> India is more aligned to the United States than it would be to China. And as a result, the BRICS really faces a lot of those deficits in really coming to some common positions. So yes, BRICS is important. Yes, together they're major economies. Uh, but the United States, of course, is still one large, coherent, single entity. And as a result, is likely to push, uh, to have a greater say than, than the BRIC mm. bloc for what it stands as today. Uh, Simon, what is your sense when you look at China and the fact that they uh, intervene in their currency quite extensively? We've seen an appreciation uh, on their own MIMBY, but some say not nearly enough to make a significant difference. We talk of imbalances, and you corrected me earlier by saying striking a balance. Some would say that China is creating an imbalance, and not only with the developed world, but also within the emerging market space. There's certainly concerns there. I know Brazil, particularly within the BRICS group, has concerns around uh, China's currency policy. Although we have seen a marked appreciation of, of the renminbi in recent years, uh, and that's obviously been underreported given the dramatic uh, dialogue around the US-China trade deficit and how China is supporting that deficit through uh, the control that it exerts over its currency. But there's several underlying factors which really mitigate against, against a coherent view of this policy. And I think China certainly has made some very dramatic moves to adjust uh, in line not only with uh, emerging world pressures, but particularly with advanced world pressures. So it's certainly not a closed book, and China's shown very strong willingness to amend and adapt that strategy.